Please take your Bibles and turn back to that portion of Scripture we read just a few moments ago over in Exodus chapter 15, looking at verses 22 through 27. As you know, we're in the middle of a series looking at the ten times that the Jews rebelled against God in their wilderness wanderings. Test number four, a very important test, the test at Rephidim, taught us lessons about prayer and about spiritual warfare. And that brought us to a subdivision of the spiritual warfare in which we are involved. So on May 6th, we started looking with many interruptions in between, like Mother's Day and Father's Day and other things as well, special events. We started looking at the fourfold division of the angelic military uh, echelons that are mentioned by the Apostle Paul. The first was principalities, the arche, the first ones, used by Paul of angels and demons who were invested with power, and we saw our key verse in Romans 8.38 that told us that we're secure, even if the most powerful demons come against us, they cannot separate us from the love of God. We saw that Jesus is more powerful than the most powerful demons. We saw that the resurrection and the ascension guarantees that Jesus is greater than the greatest demons. We saw that the church is being used by God to teach both angels and demons his manifold wisdom. We saw that Jesus created even the highest levels of angels before they fell and became demons. We saw that Jesus is higher in authority than the angels and demons, and he spoiled them at the cross. We saw Arche is also used of humans who are ordained to government in different spheres of power and authority which is what brought us to our second word there in Ephesians chapter 6, principalities and powers, and the word powers is exousia. That's the word that means authorities or jurisdictions, areas in which authority is exercised, as in the term police jurisdiction. That word is used both of human and angelic authority in jurisdictions, and it's also used of the authority and the jurisdiction of Christ. It is the scope of authority of Christ that was frequently challenged, not merely his ability, because nobody who ever saw him do a miracle questioned his power, his ability to do things, but they questioned his authority to do things. And we learn from that seven different things. Number one, Jesus has authority to forgive sins. Number two, Jesus can delegate authority over demons and sickness to others. And uh, we talked about how the charismatic leaders claim that for themselves, but they've never been given that authority by the Lord Jesus Christ. Third, we saw that Jesus used his authority, and that's what Exousia is dealing with. He used his authority over sickness to prove that he was the Messiah to the religious leaders. Fourth, we saw that Exousia also has a general use. It's the word that is used of human authorities over certain jurisdictions, as well as demons who have been assigned by Satan over certain portions of the earth. We saw number five that no angelic or human authority can separate us from the love of Christ, just like no principality can separate us from the love of Christ. We saw that exousia refers to legitimate spheres of authority as well as the demonic spheres of jurisdiction. And we saw that the term may even be used to refer to authorities who are persecuting Christians and yet they have legitimate, that is, supported by law, authority. And as I hope you got when we went through that discussion, just because something is legal does not make it morally right. For example, abortion, physician-assisted suicide, and so-called gay marriage. It may be legal, but it's not morally right. We saw that Satan gives power to the Antichrist. And we saw there are always three key elements to exousia, to authority. Number one, the source, and they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. That's the source. Number two, timing, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. And three, scope, how broad is the authority? And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations, so source, time, and scope. Those are the key elements when we're dealing with authority. And Jesus has it all because he is the source as the creator God. The timing is for all of eternity, and the scope is over all of creation. Then on June 10th, that brought us to the study of authority in the New Testament, 
and we began one of the most extended discussions about the issues of authority in the New Testament out of Romans chapter 13. <clears throat> that's where it starts off, and it says, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, that's exousia, for there is no power, exousia, but of God. The powers that be, exousia, again, are, are ordained of God. So Paul is telling us God is the one that ordains the authorities and the authority structures in the world, and we're supposed to be obedient to us. In fact, we find exousia used five times in verses 1 through 3. Now, this is a very important issue to understand because Satan wants you to go either to the right or to the left of what the Bible says on the subject. Some Christians teach that you must obey everything that the government tells you to do. Others go by the motto, question authority, and they never obey anything unless they absolutely have to. The biblical balance is in between. The areas of authority that God has given to government include four things and four things only. One of them can be divided in half, so you can argue and say there are five things, but, but the authority granted to government is limited. It's limited as to its time. It's limited to, as to its scope. Even though God gives government authority and he is, has the right to do it with every government on the earth, yet he limits the scope of the authority. And there are four things where he has limited it. Number one, to civil and social order based on the principles of divine law. Government is granted by God civil authority and social order based on principles of divine law. Number two, and this is the one that can be divided in half, God has granted to government authority in the area of criminal law and national defense, or we call war. And in criminal law, that also includes the subheading of capital punishment. God has granted that right to government. Number three, God has given to government the responsibility of establishing a national moral conscience based on divine law in the context of Romans 2. And finally, God has given the government to tax you. And we have to pay our taxes because that is an authority that God has given to government. Paul passed that teaching about obedience to government to the next generation of preachers, Timothy and Titus, and we saw that over in Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. In other words, it's something to be passed down to every generation in this age in which we live. Just like God teaches the archangels and demons his wisdom as he deals with the church, he also teaches the jurisdiction angelic and demonic authorities, those assigned to various heavenly jur jurisdictions by what he is doing in the church, and we saw that in Ephesians 3.10. That brings us to today, where we see exousia is also used to speak of the authority of darkness as opposed to the authority of light. Now, I know for a congregation like this, this is a no-brainer, but Christ is the light that breaks the darkness. But without Christ, darkness already has authority over every human being. And we're not just talking about, you know, the sun shining out there and then going behind the earth, coming between it and the sun as we're in the dark. We're talking about spiritual light and spiritual darkness too. The spirit realm, there are levels of authority just as there are in the physical realm. If you have your Bibles, please open them to Colossians chapter 1. Because we have here ten different things that Jesus accomplishes in breaking the power of darkness. Colossians 1, beginning in verse 12. Giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet, to be partaker of the inheritance of the saints in light. So here we've got light. And then he talks about the darkness in verse 13. Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness. That's the exousia of darkness. The authority of darkness. You started under the authority of darkness. And hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the in image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. So here we have two of the words that we saw over in Ephesians chapter 6, principalities and powers. And powers is exousia. Everything was created by him and for him. That includes the levels of authority. 
and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things, that is in all things, that includes the exousia, he might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. He explains that more in Colossians 2.9, for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. What Paul is setting the stage for here in chapter 1 is showing how Jesus Christ is related to creation. He's related to salvation. He's related to breaking the power of Satan. And the reason he can do it is because he is God in the flesh, Colossians 2.9, which he gets to in the next chapter. So according to Colossians 1, when Jesus breaks the power of darkness, it accomplishes these 10 things. At least it accomplishes more than this, but at least these 10 are mentioned here in Colossians chapter 1. Number one, it gives us an eternal inheritance with other believers. It gives us an eternal inheritance with other believers, which have made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Number two, it brings us into the kingdom of Christ, hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Number three, it gives us redemption through the blood of Christ, that's in verse 14, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Number four, it gives us forgiveness of sins, the very next phrase, even the forgiveness of sins. And then it shows how we have personal contact with God in at least three different aspects of his character. Number one, it gives us personal contact with the invisible God. Number two, it gives us personal contact with the creator God. It gives us personal contact, number seven, gives us personal contact with God, the Lord Jesus, who is the head of the body. Number eight, and this was really fascinating. I, I, I had already known and already studied and already preached to you all before about this, um, how he holds all things together, by him all things consist, and how that's a, a phrase that clearly deals with Christ holding all the atoms together so they don't blow apart. Science have wondered for a long time, why don't they just fly apart? I mean, the electrons are spinning around the, the central atoms, uh, the central part of the atoms, <clears throat> and they're coming up with other parts now that I don't even know all of them, but I heard something on the radio. Oh, they found something else. Uh, but I mean, why doesn't it fall apart? Well, that's why, because Jesus holds it together. But as I was thinking about that in the context here, that's what guarantees our eternal security because he holds us together too. Number nine, it guarantees our resurrection. He's the firstborn from the dead. That means there are others besides the firstborn. And number 10, it puts all authority in its proper order. Satan has usurped authority. Satan has tried to twist authority. Satan has tried to get authority out of its proper order. But in him, he's going to have all the preeminence. That means first place, he's in charge, he's in control. Everything comes back together the way it's supposed to be and the way it's supposed to be for us in Christ. So light is set in contrast to darkness as a major theme uh, in the Bible. It goes back to the very beginning, obviously. You know that from Genesis 1. You know that from John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. But something else that I think is very important that we need to think about Light and darkness are also essential to the concept of time. Light and darkness are essential to the concept of time. Time was originally started with the separation of light and darkness. In the heavenly Jerusalem, which is eternity future, the book of Revelation tells us there will be no night there. Wow. We move into eternity where it's all light. But you know, we begin creation punctuating the darkness of eternity past. God said, let there be light. And there was light. Beginning of time. But we end creation with light eradicating 
darkness. And that moves us into eternity future. I think there's a fascinating thought of the darkness of eternity past, the brightness of eternity future. In between, the struggle between good and evil, light and darkness, Jesus, the light of the world, coming in to give light to everyone who believes on him. Genesis 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. you understand that you can't really present the gospel <clears throat> without believing in fiat creation? The gospel of John is written to draw people to Christ to salvation. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. That's the end of the gospel of John. It tells you at the end what the purpose was, and it tells you at the beginning what you have to believe. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, And without him, that's Jesus, he's the word. Verse 14 tells you that. Without him was not anything made that was made. Now we get to the first statement of creation. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. John was a creationist. John was a literal seven-day creationist. Six days of creation, one day of rest. John's the one that tells you the gospel by which you are saved. If you reject the Christ presented by John, you are not saved. The Christ presented by John is, first of all, as presented as the creator who in six days created and on the seventh day he rested. No long ages, no death and suffering prior to sin entering the world, no evolution of man from monkeys and primates. Only God knows the hearts. But sometimes when I hear so-called theistic evolutionists speak or threshold creationists speak, I wonder, are these people saved? Because the Christ of Scripture, the Christ in which you must believe in order to be saved, is the Creator God, and He's presented that way in the opening verses of Genesis, and we start with the creation of light, breaking the darkness. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, that is, John was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. Do you get the idea that light is important to John? That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. And I say, okay, that's good, Jesus is the light. We'll preach it, Jesus is the light. Did you know he gave you that job? Jesus himself, personally, is the light of the world. But he has delegated us to take his place as lights while he personally is not visible. John 8, 12. Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. As long as I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. But then you look at Matthew 5, 14. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on an hill cannot 
be hid. You know the illustrations Jesus gives. If you light a candle, you stick it on a candlestick. So it gives light to the whole house. You don't light a candle and hide it under a bushel basket. You don't light a candle and shove it under the bed. Good way to burn yourself down. <laughs> but you hold it up where everyone can see it. And he says, you're that light. What kind of light do you have to your neighbors? Do they just sort of know you as a goody two-shoes? Oh yeah, those are guys are Christians, those are goody two-shoes. Or do they know you as someone who loves Christ with all your heart? You're willing to suffer for him. You're willing to do whatever he asks you to do. You're willing even to confront them in love and tell them they need salvation and only Jesus can give it. To confront them and tell them they're living in darkness and what they're doing is wickedness and filthiness and immorality in the sight of God. Oh, they may hate you. Jesus said, don't be surprised. If they hate the master, they hate the servant. If they persecute the master, they persecute the servant. If they kill the master, they kill the servant. We have outreach coming up, folks. What are you going to do to be the light of the world? Not the light that's hidden under a bushel basket here in our buildings where nobody sees unless they happen to notice our sign out front for Summer Bible School. Would you be willing to make the resolve between now and the first day of Summer Bible School to invite at least three families with children to attend Summer Bible School? Are you willing to be that much light? There are plenty of brochures. They're all over there on a table in the gymnasium. Tells all the details about Summer Bible School. Would you be willing to personally, with a friendly demeanor, and not just running away as soon as you hand them a packet, be willing to invite three families with children to come to Summer Bible School? Because Jesus said, ye are the light of the world. As long as he's not present, we're it. Did you get that? He was only one, but a pretty powerful witness. There are millions of us. Shouldn't the world be lighted up by now? Ye are the light of the world. Now, I know we're wrestling against all these horrible, wicked things. But the only way that you overcome darkness, the only way you overcome darkness is with light. Now, with that in mind, let's go back to exousia, authority and jurisdiction. Next, we see the demonic authorities, the spheres of jurisdiction, were among the levels of demonic authority spoiled at the cross in the same way the principalities were spoiled at the cross. Colossians 2.15, And having spoiled principalities and powers, that's our word, exousia, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Jude makes it clear that the authority of Christ is never diminished, but it will last forever. Jude 25, you hear me quoted every week. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and exousia and power, both now and ever. Amen. It never stops. All delegated authority stops at some point. All sub-authority stops at some point. The authority of Christ never stops. 
Next, authority can also be granted to states of being and locations of being. Interesting. We see that in the book of Revelation. States of being and locations of being. Revelation beginning, uh, chapter 6, beginning in verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. That is a state of being. It's not annihilation. It is a state of being. And hell, now that's interesting, followed with him. That's a location of being. So you have a state of being and a location of being. And power, that's our word exousia. A power, authority was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with the sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. When we get to the book of Revelation and we begin to see how many people are killed, over 50% of the world's population, which means over 4 billion people, are going to be killed during that seven-year period. Over 50% of the world's population. When you add together all the different groups of people that are being killed by the different plagues as you go through the book of Revelation, folks, the world has never seen that kind of thing to date, except with the flood of Noah. The judgment of God killed everybody, but Noah and his wife, his four sons, uh, three sons and their three wives, The tribulation, over half of them are going to be killed before Jesus Christ comes back and consumes the earth with fire and kills everybody. Bad days ahead. Guess what? Ye are the light of the world. Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and nobody listened. Good thing to remember when you try to use, but they're not paying attention to me, as your excuse. It really doesn't matter whether you get a good response. It really doesn't matter whether you are successful. What matters is, are you obedient? Ye are the light of the world. He that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him, and power was given them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. The next place we see delegated authority is the two witnesses. We'll talk more about them. Who are they? I think the Bible tells us who the two witnesses are. These have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have power over waters to turn them to blood, and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. And you know, if anybody tries to say, hey, you guys, you better stop, fire comes out of their mouth and devours them. Who are they? But they have authority. These have authority to shut heaven heaven. Wow, that's pretty big. You walk outside and you say, clouds go away. No more rain. Thunderstorms stop. And everything is dry. And dry. And dry. They have the authority to shut heaven. They have the authority to bring plagues. I hope those are bringing some people to mind to you who had some strange things happen at the end of their lives. Next, we see holy angels are also given authority to implement the judgments of the Great Tribulation. So not only do we have the two witnesses who are in the middle of the Great Tribulation, but we have the holy angels are also given specific points of authority to implement the judgments of the Great Tribulation. For example... Revelation chapter 16, verses 8 and 9. 
And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power, that's exousia, power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God that hath power, that's exousia again, over these plagues, and they repented not to give him the glory. That always astounds me. When you get especially down to the bold judgments, I mean, you, you look, Revelation 16, I mean, that's the final set of judgments that God pours on the earth. They occur during a one-week period of time. You have the first judgments, the seal judgments, cover three and a half years. The seventh seal opens up and the seven trumpets come out. That covers the next three and a half years, up to the last week of the Great Tribulation period. And then God says, why won't you listen? And he goes, bang, 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 bang. Seven of them. One right after another in one week time. And they refuse to repent. They know it's God. It tells you that with almost all of the uh, bold judgments. They know that it's God. And yet they shake their fists at him and say, we will not repent. We enjoy our sin. We don't care what you do to us. We will not repent. You understand the hardness of the human heart? Guess what? Ye are the light of the world. You say, but if they won't repent, when God has given that kind of judgment, what hope do I have? You have no hope other than you must obey. And God is the one who works in the human heart to receive the gospel of Christ. He does it sovereignly, but he uses human instrumentality. And ye are the light of the world. Let me say it again. Summer Bible School is coming up in just a few weeks. Will you invite personally, warmly, encouragingly, three families with children to come to Summer Bible School and then follow up on them? Give them another call. Stop by their house. Say, hey, you know, if you've got any problems with bringing the kids, I'd, I'd be happy to take them. Or, you know, another family is coming along. Would you like to come with us? We'll go as a group. Only God can open their hearts. Collingswood is a dark city. But ye are the light of the world. And God uses light to break the darkness. Oh dear people, I cry for this town. I often weep about how dark it is. And God put us here. He didn't put somebody else. He put us here in this town. Holy angels, Another illustration, Revelation 18, verses 1 and 2. After these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great exousia, great power, great authority, and the earth was lightened with his glory. <laughs> God makes an angel show up with light. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the whole of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. We'll talk about how this relates to Rome when we get there. There are two Babylons over in the book of Revelation. Join us on Sunday evenings. Next, the authority of Christ will be fully manifested. The exousia of Christ will be fully manifested when Satan and his angels are cast out and the martyred believers are avenged by Jesus. 
Did you know Jesus is going to avenge the blood of all the believers who have been murdered because of their testimony for Christ? Jesus personally will avenge their blood. Revelation chapter 12, beginning in verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil. So you know right away who that symbol is. It's talking about the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power, the exousia of his Christ. Here we find the final establishment of the authority of Christ. He is an authority, but he establishes it here. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Oh, this is the tough part here. And they loved not their lives unto the death. If you're the light of the world, do you think Satan wants you piercing the darkness? Or will he try to snuff you out? You know the song. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Don't let Satan it out. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Let it shine. Hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hide it under a bushel, no, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Ye are the light of the world. That's not just a children's song. We tell children to be the light of the world. How about us as adults? I'm going to let it shine. We usually think of the Antichrist as the only one who receives authority from the devil and all the rest are merely horrible pagans cursing God and following their own lusts. But during the Great Tribulation, there is more than one person on earth involved in global control that receives authority and ability from Satan. Listen to this. Revelation chapter 13, verses 4, 5, 7, and 12. And they worship the dragon which gave exousia unto the beast. Now, we already knew who the dragon was. It says, the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan. So, the earth is worshiping the dragon which gave authority unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast, who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, that blasphemies and exousia, power, was given unto him, that is the beast. Listen very carefully here to continue 42 months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And I was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power, exousia, was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. So he is exercising authority given to him by the beast over the entire globe. But look at verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the exousia, all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed, which is a counterfeit resurrection, as we'll see, because the first beast, the Antichrist, is going to claim to be Christ, and he's going to counterfeit the resurrection. But here's a second individual who has his exousia, his authority from the dragon. That brings us to the next word, and we're running out of time, but I'll cover just this one because this is a short one. The next word in Paul's list describes the top level of the demonic division of authority. The rulers, rulers, that's what's called a hapax legomena. That means this is the only place in the entire Bible where this word is found. The only place, Ephesians 6.12. It's cosmocrator. That's a compound word from the word cosmos, which is usually translated world, and 
Krator, which is the word for a dictator. That's one who uses violent strength to seize and to retrain, uh, retain. Uh, you sort of see that in North Korea. This is a reference to Satan and the highest demons immediately under him. He's got all these different levels, but the ones that are right around Satan's throne, so to speak, the ones by which he is doing his greatest violence to the earth and sending out all the henchmen to do this stuff, it says, these are the rulers, the cosmocrator. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. The cosmocrator this super powerful world dictator. Satan is the strong man whom Jesus binds in Matthew and Mark. Only the Lord Jesus Christ is stronger than the strong man who is violently strong dictator who rules the violent murderous forces of darkness. Jesus refers to him this way, he says, or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his good except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his house. Mark 3, 27, no man can enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he will first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. Well, our time is up. The next one, spiritual wickedness, is a fascinating word. It's actually, a, it, it describes some of the most incredible moral character of Satan, just like holiness describes the moral character of God. But we'll have to close there. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for your word and for its power. It reminds us that we are indeed involved in a war, and yet you've given us the armor to wear. You've given us the sword to use, which cannot be defeated. You've given us commission to go. You've given us the empowerment of your Holy Spirit, and nothing is stronger than he. And you've told us that while Jesus is not here on earth, we are the lights of the world. Yet, most of us never light our wick. Most of us hide it under a bushel or under a bed or let the devil poof it out. Gracious Father, help us to understand as we move through these next few weeks that this is a critical time in the life of this church. Every one of us needs to be involved in some way in inviting others to come hear the good news. We pray, Father, for your blessings on the upcoming parade. We pray that you will cause those of our number who are able to walk that route to put the materials into the hands, specifically into the hands, pre-directed and pre-ordained by you the hands of children and adults who need to hear the good news of Christ and whose hearts you will open and draw to the Savior. Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege of studying your word. We pray for your blessings on it to our hearts, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.